Well, my friends, we have huge developments with a launch date target for Flight Test 3. We actually have a lot of new detail on that as we now count down only days till a potential flight. It has indeed been an absurd week of flights, one after the other proving that SpaceX are not messing around in 2024. Hey, hey, Mark S. House with you here. You want some really great Starship news? Boy, do we have loads as we prepare for hopefully the final days before launch. A week ago, Ship 29 had just arrived at suborbital pad B after having been moved there from the build site. The week kicked off with a surprise move, having it transported over from here to the orbital pad. Why exactly they chose to bring it over here is just speculative, but I suspect this was a great chance to record some amazing footage and images for some future showcase material. Why not, right? Anyway, they didn't keep it there for long because later that day, the ship was moved back to suborbital pad B, hooked up to the crane with the new two-point lifter system, and it was hoisted up onto the pad. Now, the big question was, would we see a full wet dress rehearsal of the integrated vehicles for Flight Test 3, or a static fire for Ship 29? The priority, of course, must be the full stack, you may think, and you would, of course, be absolutely right, because SpaceX went ahead to prepare the orbital launch site. The work platform was lowered and moved away, followed soon after with a routine test of the detonation suppression system. Now, Sunday, as you may have spotted, was the anniversary of Starship SN10's flight. That was three years ago. Can you believe that? Mary shared that she had received an evacuation notice for the wet dress rehearsal, so this was going to be an eventful day. The evacuation order came into action during the evening as this special warning was passed through the PA system. Indeed, the pad clear alarm had kicked off and the streamlined procedure was ready to start once again. The tower arms disconnected from Ship 28, spread out and then lowered slightly to the usual launch position. The tank farm began to vent away as those systems started up and another detonation suppression system there. Now, this was yet another test using both liquid oxygen and methane together. So with that higher risk, the sheriff moved the closure from the normal testing roadblock all the way back to the build site entrance. As if it were close work, the orbital launch mount and the tower venting began simultaneously as the cryogenic liquid slowly began to make its way over to the pads. This test in particular was exciting because there's been some big upgrades here. Now once the venting had stopped, the propellant load kicked off at a tremendous pace. We first saw the frost on Ship 28's liquid oxygen tank, and a few minutes later that was also climbing up both of the boosters tanks. Remember, the lower tanks are for the oxygen and the upper tanks for the methane, and that is because the ratio of methane is much less, which leaves a higher percentage of the total mass at the bottom of the vehicles as the load increases. Here was the big change though. With all the tank farm upgrades we've seen over the last few months, we knew that SpaceX had the capability to load faster, but they completely knocked it out of the park here. The whole process of loading the absolutely mind-boggling 4,600 metric tons or a little over 10 million pounds of propellant took just over 40 minutes. That is crazy. The propellant mass alone of a fully stacked Starship is about 10 times that of the Falcon 9. Now just to compare here, Falcon 9's loading time is just under 35 minutes. This is insane actually. The Starship loading process was feeding in 115 tons of propellant every minute. That's almost two tons per second. SpaceX were testing a full launch sequence and countdown internally as soon after another detonation suppression system indicated the point where SpaceX would ignite the engines. That there was as far as they can realistically test, so the wet dress rehearsal was complete and both vehicles started the detanking process. Once the vehicles were empty, workers were allowed back to the pad, and the last big ticket item for the day was this deluge test, which you could only just make out there through the mist. Of course, a wet dress rehearsal isn't complete without the official photos from SpaceX, and they are absolutely incredible this time around. They said that they pushed the countdown all the way to T minus 10 seconds, which is great. The water deluge system in real life, of course, kicks in at around T minus 5 seconds, and I imagine they test that separately when the vehicles are unloaded, simply for safety reasons. So now that the launch rehearsal was over, the Starship needed to be destacked. This was always going to be needed, of course, because they needed to install the flight termination system before the final flight. Soon enough, we could see them working on the ship, even testing the tile attachments near the weld seams that aren't actually attached with the pins, just the adhesives. 
Now, you probably even noticed with the wet dress rehearsal going on that the ship quick disconnect arm still had a load of scaffolding all over the place. Well, it was now time for that to go, starting from the section closest to the tower and eventually to the end of the arm with the booster 10 there in view. Also, down at the launch mount itself, teams have disconnected the booster stabilization pins there, which help guide the booster to the exact position needed. Now, those are removed from the launch mount once the booster is ready for flight, as they don't have any adequate shielding from the monstrous force of the booster's exhaust at liftoff. That is another item off the checklist. So, okay, I can hear you almost shouting at the screen at this point. When is this beast going to fly? Well, my friends, an X broadcast popped up catching our attention aiming for Pi Day, or March the 14th. On Wednesday, we saw the first appearance of the Notice to Mariners once again showing a similar trajectory over the Gulf of Mexico. But to top that off, SpaceX updated their website with the new flight plan. Surprise, there is a number of changes to the flight compared to the previous. It is now confirmed that SpaceX will be attempting to open and close the Starship's payload bay door and perform a propellant transfer demonstration during the upper stages coast phase. At this point, the vehicle may indeed be on a full the orbital trajectory, but we'll need to see the final velocity to know for sure. In this mission, they are also going to perform the first ever relight of a Raptor engine in space, hopefully, of course, ending in a controlled re-entry of Starship. But interestingly, they've changed the target splashdown to occur now in the Indian Ocean rather than off the coast of Hawaii. Now, of course, the first question that everybody's going to have is do we actually have the FAA launch license? Well, as of right now, we don't yet have the official launch license and the approvals are hopefully happening behind closed doors. I think we consider this a great sign of intention. Finally, to top all that evidence off though, Fabian here caught the squad carrying the flight termination system charges towards the vehicles. They began almost immediately installing those onto both the ship and the booster. By this time next week, we may indeed have witnessed this next exciting and colossal event. So anyway, with all of that out of the way, there was more to come this week with Ship 29. Now that Ship 28 was back down, we weren't going to see any static fire at all, but we did see the ship unhooked and we saw the flaps were opened once more as the fog lifted. All four of the flaps actuated in and out for a quick test, and the crane moved away from the pads as more tests on those continued. On Thursday, they attempted to get somewhere with engine testing as a nicely iced up ship proceeded through to an engine chill, but ultimately that ended in an abort, signalled by this long depress vent. Not sure what the problem was there as it hasn't been shared by SpaceX, hopefully the next attempt will be successful. Now take a look over here close by though. Yes, it seems that the initial groundwork for the second orbital launch pad is already kicking off. This isn't for anything structural just yet. For now, this rig installs drainage wicks so that the area around the second orbital launch pad and tower is dewatered. This will firm up the soil, helping to prevent erosion and upheaval failure. That is essentially where the soil moves upward over time due to the ground being oversaturated. Now let's just move over to the Sanchez area of the build site where a rusty grid fin was removed from the old Booster 4, but interestingly, they have only removed the one. Perhaps they're wanting to inspect it for some reason, or maybe this is part of a larger plan to scrap the entire booster. We'll just need to wait to see on that, but nearby things are continuing along also with Booster 14's aft section making its appearance this week and ending up in front of the Mega Bay. Randolph Visuals actually caught it here too, capturing everything in great detail. That night when the fog appeared once again, it was moved inside the Mega Bay ahead of stacking on the rest of the liquid oxygen tank. Big thanks to Randolph Visuals there. It has been truly amazing seeing the community enjoying all of his hard work capturing scenes like this almost daily. We appreciate you there, Chief. Thanks for following and subscribing to his work there, and likewise for checking that you are still subscribed and supporting our little slice of the internet here. I still can't believe that we get to do this as an actual job just because of you. Of course, another huge event of the week was yet another mission by NASA and SpaceX's commercial crew program. 
Yes, it was finally time for Crew 8, the first crewed SpaceX launch of the year. The countdown was finally on last Sunday for this mission to the International Space Station, and in the lead up, SpaceX shared this bunch of terrific images of them mating the Crew 8 Dragon to the Falcon 9 before it rolled out to Pad 39A. Another nice shot of that rollout there with the moon in the background, a nice symbol for the future goals of SpaceX with the Starship and the Artemis programs. Now, soon of course it was vertical on the pad where the crew got together to gear up for a full launch day rehearsal. There was the static fire test, and what you will immediately notice is just how clean that booster is. That was in fact because this is a brand new booster being welcomed to the fleet, number 1083. Spaceflight now caught the action of those Merlins firing off together, and with the static fire out of the way, we just needed to wait until launch time. Originally that was scheduled for March the 1st, but that was pushed to the next day due to high winds. Now, that day by the way actually happens to be the 5th anniversary of the first Crew Dragon's flight, which happened in 2019. Wait, five years? I don't know where the time goes. Anyway, big thanks to Greg Scott for patiently waiting through the lead up here. As they say, patience is a virtue. Sadly, Crew 8 didn't get to fly on that anniversary date with another weather related scrub. Would the next day be good for Crew 8? More like Crew Late, as Andreas Morgensen posted back direct from the ISS. Some sweet sarcasm there by the awesome pilot of Crew 7. And indeed, Sunday was the day. The crew suited up, popped out to their Teslas, and off they were to board the beast that would take them to orbit. One last look there before getting into the elevator and hitting that to space button. First walking down the crew access arm we have the commander of the mission, NASA's Matthew Dominic, and it is his first time to space. We then have the mission's pilot Michael Barrett who is also a physician and the most experienced among the crew given that he has been to space twice already. In fact in 2011 he was part of that last space shuttle discovery flight. We then have mission specialist Jeanette Epps, also going to space for the first time, and cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin, also a mission specialist. The entire crew signed their names on the white room at the end of the crew access arm, and that is 50 crew members in total now and counting. It was time to board the beautiful Crew Dragon Endeavour. The hatch securely closed, and the Crew Dragon arm soon retracted. Just remember that this is the fifth time that Endeavour has made its way to the International Space Station. Yet another incredible example of reusability as the seconds ticked Two, off the countdown one, to launch. Ignition, engines full power, and liftoff of NASA Crew A. Go Falcon, go SpaceX, and go NASA. Off it roared from the pad late into the evening. A glorious NASA 4K stream that was sadly anything but 4K, but we'll take what we can get. I think the only thing that was actually 4K was NASA's logo spinning in the top there. Anyway, look at this ground shot released by SpaceX after stage separation. What we are seeing here is the second stage's exhaust interacts with the first stage's boost backburn, and this creates this bizarre effect that can understandably freak some people out if they don't know what it is. Jerry Pike actually snapped this absolute ripper of a shot. Just check that out. Luckily of course these views are pretty common in this region now, but yeah, amazing every time I see it. The booster of course was on yet another return to launch site mission, screaming back to touch down at landing zone 1. That was followed by Dragon separation as it drifted gently away to catch up with the International Space Station for docking. That came up the next day as Dragon docked there with the Harmony module, and yes, after the hatch was opened and Crew 8 were greeted by the ISS crew, now there will be a handover period of five days or so, and then Crew 7 will be able to get ready to make their way back home after their six month long mission. The station is super busy up there really, you've got double Dragons, two Progress vehicles, Cygnus 20, also launched by SpaceX, and Soyuz. That's pretty crazy. But it was not as crazy as this week, because that was just the very beginning of SpaceX's Falcon 9 action this week. Here is Falcon 9 Booster 1081 standing tall on the other side of the country now at Vandenberg for the brand new installment of SpaceX's small satellite rideshare program. Yes, this was the exciting Transporter 10 mission taking 53 different satellites to orbit in one go. That by the way included this Australian satellite from Space Machines Company that I mentioned a few weeks ago. I'll come back to that in a second, but just check out the variety of different payloads on board. I find this incredibly cool. Remember, payloads can be added onto this mission for as little as $300,000 for about 50 kilograms or 110 pounds. 
Typically, these are going into an almost polar sun-synchronous orbit, such as this mission. We had incredible daylight scenes of the liftoff as it soared into the clear blue Californian sky. Added to that, check out these really focused tracking shots after Max-Q. Incrementally, I think the camera views still seem to continually get better and better. I am, however, still really hoping that X will at some point broadcast at higher resolutions. I kind of feel like that is the only thing missing now. Stage separation there, and again we got more tracking shots of the first stage booster returning to the launch site. This is certainly one of the best views of that given the time of day. You can actually see the attitude control nitrogen puffs clearly from the ground here. Fairing separation again revealed the satellites sharing the ride to the vacuum of space. For the booster we had camera views on board and also from the ground tracking the descent all the way through from the entry burn to the landing. We even had these views in stereo there and BAM! There it was touched down on landing zone 4, the fifth flight for that beast, and now came the rest of the lengthy mission to deploy all 53 satellites in their designated drop-off points. Now, that included four separate pre-planned engine burns. Among those satellites was the largest ever sent by Australia, around 270 kilograms or just under 600 pounds. Optimus 1, made by Space Machines Company, is a mission carrying seven customer payloads of its own. Sadly, we didn't get to see it actually deploy as it was done off camera in a period of blackout. But we did hear the call out. Optimus separation confirmed. Now, if you want to know more about the inner payloads on board, I talk about them in this video here. Essentially, though, this is Space Machine's first attempt in establishing a scalable and sustainable space operations framework. In the future, they even hope to be able to service satellites in orbit or even help to deorbit damaged or broken satellites. The full set of payloads SpaceX deployed over the full two and a half hours, satellites popping off all over the place with the orbits changed by SpaceX as needed with the aid of the Merlin vacuum engine. Now, what was a little unusual though, was that SpaceX also had yet another Falcon 9 flight for Starlink within this mission. In fact, for a while, we were even watching a split screen of that mission within the stream for Transporter 10. Yes, it was a SpaceX Falcon 9 mission inception, kicking off a little under two hours after the previous liftoff. Of course, SpaceX did also stream that separately, so we'll move over to the full camera feed at Slick40 back at Florida. You can just imagine the precision that it needs to schedule all these the way that they are right now. Speaking of precision, our sponsor Henson Shaving Today fits in with all that beautifully. Henson was created by these genius aerospace machinists who took all that know-how from making super precise parts for space applications and thought, hey, why not make shaving better as well? It certainly turns out that they absolutely nailed that. I've been using their AL13 razor here for over a year and a half now, and since they sent me this first one to try, I've not used anything else, like at all. It is absolutely the easiest and the best shave that I've ever had. It's all about precision with these guys. We are talking about these blades only sticking out by 0.03 of a millimeter, all while being supported beautifully right along the razor. I'm sure like me you've tried ridiculously overpriced plastic disposable razors that flex all over the place. That causes this chatter issue which is what causes most of the skin irritation. They even did this cool test where they had people shave one side of their face with a regular multi blade razor and the other side with the AL13. The difference was night and day with way less irritation from Henson's razor. That is good news because 88% of us say that we have experienced regular shaving irritation and two thirds say that they expect it when they shave. Well, not with the Henson razor. The next best thing though is just how cost effective it is over time. Yes, the initial unit is premium, but after that all you need is standard double edged blades which are super cheap. So sticking with a Henson means your shaving costs for the year are practically nothing. In fact, they are offering 100 blades completely free. You just head to hensonshaving.com, select the razor in whatever color you like, and make sure to add that 100 blade pack to your cart. Once you enter in the code Marcus in the last step of the checkout process, those blades will pop up free. Thank you, Henson Shaving. So back to the Starlink Group 641 mission, this made it three Falcon 9 launches all within 20 hours. 
20 hours. That really is incredible, isn't it? And this booster 1073 on the pad, if you can even see it there through the fog, was off in no time. Now, interestingly, with this set of Starlink satellites, the total number of space lasers in the network has exceeded 10,000. With those laser links, they can literally beam data around the world without needing ground stations in between. The more lasers in the network, the more pathways they have from any source on Earth to a destination. Truly incredible technology. Soon enough, of course, we had stage separation, and we were then watching the booster go all the way out to land on the ocean, this time on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. That was its 13th landing. Now, Elon also posted that SpaceX has now achieved peak download speeds of 17 megabits per second directly between a satellite and an unmodified Samsung Android phone. Of course, that is using the new direct-to-sell satellites launched a while back, and those satellites, according to Jonathan McDowell's tracking data, are still about 200 kilometers from their final orbit. It is just crazy to me that it's even possible to send data at speeds similar to a 4G network from all the way up there in space, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you want to continue with more space goodness, you might enjoy this video right here, or maybe these videos. Thanks for watching all this way through as always, and I'll see you all in the next video.